There we go. And again, good evening and welcome um, to our session. I would like to introduce our presenter this evening, Carrie Wickstead. Uh, Carrie is the outreach coordinator, um, what ed education outreach specialist, excuse me, with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for your work with Envirothon. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, April. Good evening, everyone. I am so excited that you're here. It's good to see such a wonderful turnout um, for our first Envirothon review session. So my name again is Carrie Wickstead, and I work with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources within the Wildlife and Heritage Service. So we help to manage the state's wildlife resources, the ducks and the butts and everything else in between. And I'm gonna go over just some of the content that I want you to know for our wildlife section. And uh, I do wanna emphasize this training is for you. So have if you have questions or things you'd like to share, please utilize that chat. So I'd love to hear about your wildlife sightings and all of that and favorite wild animals. So we can also share a bit of that in this session as well. So just so you know, um, the wildlife section is kind of split into five main categories and you'll see this on the test. So the first category is wildlife identification. The second Second is wildlife ecology. The third is looking at wildlife conservation and management. The fourth is aging and sexing, two of our most popular game animals, the wild, wild turkey and the white-tailed deer. And then the final section is wildlife and society. So what do these sections actually mean? And I'll get into that in a second. So just so you know, um, for this test, it's going to be, for those of you who are familiar with the Envirothon test, we're going to have a number of set uh, of questions. Some of them are going to be true or false. Some of them are going to include multiple choice. Some of them are fill in the blank. And there are also short answer questions that you will be required to, to answer during the test. So that's kind of how it's going to be set up. And again, it's going to be broken into those five sections. So the training resources to kind of get you prepared and uh, on board with everything that I want you to know. You should have checked out the wildlife study guide, which is found on the Envirothon page that I've been sharing in the chat. I'll share it again, just so you have that there. So the wildlife study guide, um, it's an important document, has a lot of information in that guide. So we expect you to know that information that's found in that guide. We also have some new wildlife videos that were produced this year. So those videos include how to age white-tailed deer, how to sex and age wild turkeys, basic information on wildlife identification of birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals. So those are up on that page as well. In addition, we have three wildlife ID guides that are going to be provided on the test. For those of you who have taken Envirothon in the past, um, those wildlife ID guides are substitute for the field guides that we would have you learn how to use and um, essentially use to identify wildlife. So we won't be using the hunting guide for this test. So you don't have to worry about the hunting guide for this year, but in um, future years, when we do this uh, in person again, that is also a section that we'd like to focus on. So check out the Envirothon website. Um, it's shared in the chat and it's also accessible via the Maryland Envirothon page. So that's all your basic information. And really quick, is uh, anybody in the in this room, are you new to Envirothon? I forgot to ask that. So if you're new to Envirothon, let us know. Or um, let me know what year you are in terms of Envirothon, how many years you've participated. It's always good to know um, what the audience is, is like. Okay. So, um, <laughs> hey, Nuke. So for a virathon, um, wildlife identification is usually a big part of this, um, of this test and what we want you to know, because that's a lot of what we do. To be able to work with wildlife, you have to be able to properly identify them. And so, um, so one of the things with identification is using taxonomy, essentially classifying organisms based off of different characteristics and placing them in very broad categories and kind of narrowing it down to more specific categories. So we will be examining the kingdom Animalia for this section and then um, in the phylum Chordata, which means the chordate animals or those essentially with vertebrae. And then we'll be looking at the class mammalia, class aves, which are birds, 
and then the, um, the amphibia and reptilia. So those are the, the main classes that we'll be examining for this wildlife section. And our largest group of organisms in terms of wildlife in Maryland are actually our invertebrates, like our insects, but we won't be focusing them uh, on them for, for this section. So understanding the basics of taxonomy and how we organize these animals in, um, in these different sections is important to know. And when we're doing identification, some of the things that um, we are looking for, some of the, at least some of the things that I look for, color patterns, looking at, at certain characteristics of the animal, um, looking at like eyes or wing bars on birds or just colors around the face. Usually those are good indicators for um, species identification. The size of the animals, which is kind of hard with pictures and videos, which we'll be using for this virtual event. But looking at the size of those animals when you're outside and being able to estimate the size is really important for distinguishing some species that might look very similar. And then the habitat's also really important. We have so many different habitats here in Maryland, and that's why we have a great amount of biodiversity in the state. So understanding these different habitat types, and, and some of that is learning those tree species that you'll be covering in your forestry section and understanding those um, that soil and the organisms supported by the soils um, so that you learn about in your soil section. You'll realize that all of these different Envirothon categories are so integrated with one another and that's why they're so important for natural resource management. So understanding those, how to identify those organisms and using resources are also, um, that's another key, key thing that we want you to know, because when I go out into the field, I'm not memorizing a lot of these animals. I'm using resources like our um, field guides and things like that to assist with identification. So this year, you'll be using those PDFs as your resources. And what's really helpful is to understand some of those species groupings in advance. What are the characteristics of the family Ranidae? Um, what are the characteristics of the Picidae family? That's going to help you kind of narrow down your search and be able to identify things a lot quicker. And just looking at the chat, looks like there's a lot of first year folks. So really, really happy that you're joining us. Okay, so the next section that I want you to know is the basics of wildlife ecology. So understanding concepts like habitat and what exactly is habitat and how habitat can change. And you know how certain species use habitat at different parts of their life cycle. So see if you can type in the chat, what are the four main components of habitat? What are the four main components of habitat? Can you type those in the chat? What are the things, the four things that animals need? What are the four main components of habitat? Food, yeah, very important, right? We gotta eat. <laughs> we need water, we need shelter and space. So um, food, water, shelter, space, they all fit together like pieces in a puzzle. And, um, and you need all of those in the right arrangement to be able to support our different wildlife species here in Maryland. So as a wildlife biologist, I have to understand those components of habitat and the needs for different species and how some of these species interact with one another and, and things like food webs. So looking at, at what organisms are supporting other organisms and thinking about those connections. So when we look at this simple line of connections, that's called a food chain. But in actuality, when we really break it down, these connections are very interwoven into a giant web of connections. And we take those food webs and we, we cut them up into different levels. Does anybody know what the name for the energy levels in food webs, that, that term? It's one of those vocabulary terms. Can you guess the name for those energy levels for food webs? Good job, Genevieve. Yes, those are trophic levels. So we have different trophic levels with producers, um, aka plants and organisms that can produce their own energy. They are the ones at the lo lowest level and they're usually the most abundant. And then we go up to those herbivores, aka those animals that eat plants. We consider those those primary consumers. Then we have the omnivores, the ones that are eating those herbivores. So um, those are our secondary consumers. 
And, uh, and then we have our major predators that we consider to be our tertiary consumers. So, uh, so we have a, an abundance of these different connections and understanding that is important and understanding how populations of wildlife change. So what causes populations to increase, decrease, or stay the same? We call those wildlife population dynamics and they're also part of that wildlife ecology that we want you to know. When we're thinking about habitat, succession is also a really important component. What is succession? How would you define succession, um, plant succession, at, at least from a habitat standpoint? So that's another ecology concept that we'd like you to know about. And I have the graphic of succession there, but why don't you see if you can type in the chat, how would you define succession? takers. <laughs> How would you define succession or plant succession, I should say? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, so, so succession is these different stages. Uh, and when we're talking about plant succession, we're looking at the gradual change of those different plants um, in those communities over time. And so I have on this graphic that it's almost in a straight line from you know, bare soil to what are known as our climax or our, our penultimate communities there. But usually succession isn't this straight. So sometimes succession gets knocked back by different forces. So there might be some type of, of major weather event. Um, like quite a, quite a few years ago, we had that derecho that came through Maryland, those really strong straight winds. It was almost like a tornado. It knocked down a lot of trees and it opened up a lot of different forests. So that set back succession. And um, things like fires would also um, come through different areas and that would set back succession. If areas are logged for timber development and things like that, that could change the stage of succession that we're at. So succession is like the continual force that's happening. And there are different wildlife species that depend on these different stages of habitat um, throughout their life cycle. So some species are, are you know, what you would consider to, to use these young or early forests. Um, there's some species that are more grassland species. And there's some species that depending on the time of year are going to use these different types of forests. So that's one of the reasons why we want you to have those basic understanding of things like succession and why it matters because it's important for our wildlife species. Then the third section we get into is conservation and management. And essentially, you know, um, the two main facets of management are population management of our wildlife species and then thinking about habitat management. So what are some examples of wildlife population management that, that might be done um, to manage populations of wildlife? Why don't you type in the chat some examples of population management? How would you manage wildlife populations? Hunting, yeah. So hunting is a very important tool for our management and um, changing the seasons and the bag limits, essentially how many you can take at a time. Fires, yeah, fires actually prescribed burns would be habitat management. Introduction of predators, yes. So, um, so reintroducing species into areas, that can also be a, a, a type of population management. Yeah, fishing, relocation of problematic species, or sometimes removal of those species. If we think about invasive species and, and removing things like mute swans and nutria from our landscapes, that can be a population management. So good, um, good examples. So population management includes all sorts of things. It includes researching populations. So you can see our black bear biologist here, Harry Spiker. He, um, he does a lot of surveys on our black bears. And right now they're doing reproduction surveys in different dens here in Maryland. 
So understanding those population dynamics is part of that population management. And that goes all goes into how they how we manage these species at the state level. So we have to do that research. Some of these populations we're trying to increase when we're thinking about our rare, threatened, and endangered species. Some of them we're trying to sustain when we're thinking about our game animals or animals that are traditionally hunted or trapped. And then some of them we're trying to get rid of <laughs> or decrease. Um, so, uh, so thinking about our invasive species, we don't want those here in Maryland. So we have to manage those populations. In addition, it doesn't matter um, how many animals you have if you don't have proper habitat. So habitat management is also a big facet of wildlife management and it's integrated in with population management. So helping with um, changing the forest structures or changing succession, planting different plants out in these environments. So this is Jennifer Selfridge, our invertebrate zoologist and one of our faithful volunteers, Margaret. And they were out there doing a pollinator project to be able to plant different nectar and um, um, host plants for different butterfly species here in Maryland and, and helping to um, essentially bring back some of that grassland habitat that those species would need. That's an example of habitat management. And certainly fire is one of our management tools that we use as well. Placing out things like nest boxes or creating standing dead trees, AKA snags and um, other factors like planting food plots are also examples of habitat management that we use for wildlife conservation. So uh, another factor or thing that we want to look have you look at is how to age and sex are two most popular game animals, the wild turkey and the white tailed deer. So why do you think it matters if you can sex or age a wild turkey or white tailed deer? Why don't you type in the chat? Why would we care about aging and sexing these different animal species? Why do you want, why do you think we want you to know this information, how to do it? Why do we care about looking at this information? Just think you want, we want you to check out all the turkeys here in Maryland. See learning male to female ratio of the species, monitoring population for breeding. so they can reproduce and what resources they need, yeah. For hunting, mm hmm All very good, yeah. Yep, that's exactly why. Um, so we like to look at the age sex structures of different populations of wild animals. And this helps us figure out, you know, how to better manage for these species or if something's going wrong. So we would expect that um, in some species like, or in a lot of species, we would have more of the younger age classes than the older age classes. That's just generally how it happens, right? We have more young than, than older animals. And so, um, so we also have differences in the sex structures of these different populations. And some of this goes back to understanding the biology of these animals, the ecology of these animals. When we think of species like bobwhite quail, they're mostly monogamous during the mating season. And in those monogamous species, you would expect to have a 50-50 sex ratio. But species like white-tailed deer traditionally are polygamous. So you typically have one male mating with many females. And in those types of populations, you would expect that um, the age sex pyramids would be kind of skewed towards more females because you can have those males, um, more males mate with multiple females in that population. So this, these are examples of what we would expect for these two game species, the bobwhite quail and the white-tailed deer. But if something shifted, maybe, um, maybe for the bobwhite quail, we started seeing less recruitment or less of those younger generations. And we know there might be a problem with that species and we might have to do something with management. Same thing goes with our white-tailed deer. If we see a shift in some of these age, um, age structures, that might be a cue that something is going on. So we need to know this information to be able to properly manage for these species and also for our different populations of wildlife. 
So um, aging and sexing wild turkey is pretty straightforward because they are what are known as sexually dimorphic species, which means that the males and the females look different than one another. So it's not that um, for, you know, that's not something you see in all wildlife species, but um, they make it nice and easy, especially to see from a distance. So female turkeys, which are known as hens, um, are pretty dull in appearance typically. So they have these brown tipped breast feathers or buffy tipped breast feathers that you can see. Their heads traditionally aren't very colorful like the males and um, most of their coloration is kind of muted. So, um, and that's on purpose because they nest on the ground. So if they're bright and colorful, that's gonna tip off predators that there's a, a juicy turkey nest nearby. So um, they, they have to camouflage themselves and that's why they're not extremely showy. On their legs, you can actually tell if it's from a male or a female because um, the females lack this modified uh, male called a spur. So there's no spurs on the females, but the males have a spur. And the other thing about the females is their poop is different than the males. So you can actually find their scat, which is a fancy science term for poop. If it's in a little swirly cone-like structure out in the field, then it likely came from a female turkey, AKA a hen. In contrast, our males are bright and showy. They have black tipped breast feathers. So you'll see that black tip there. And they have almost iridescent look to their feathers. They're really gorgeous birds. Particularly in the breeding season, the male's heads become bright red, white, and blue. So a really, really showy, and they are going to be strutting very soon. So when they strut, they fan out their tails, they drag their wings along the ground and start gobbling up a storm out in fields to show off to the females, AKA the hens. So males are known as toms or gobblers and juvenile males are known as jakes. So um, the toms and the gobblers have these pointed spurs on their legs. It's a really big spike and that's used for fighting and dominance among the wild turkeys. And their scat um, is J-shaped. So I always think J for Jake. And that helps me remember that the males typically have that J-shaped structure to their scat. And I see a question from Violet, does monogamy versus polygamy affect the sex, sex ratio? And typically it does. It will often affect the sex ratio, but I don't like to say always because there are always exceptions <laughs> in nature. So for a lot of our species, we would expect a more 50-50 split if they're a monogamous species, whereas um, polygamous species, you tend to, to see a shift more towards male or female, depending on whether they're polygynous or um, polygamous. So good question. All right, so now we're going to move into white-tailed deer. And one of the things we use for aging white-tailed deer is to actually look at the wear and replacement of their teeth along their jawbones. And we have a video that kind of goes into this a bit more in detail. So when we're examining the white-tailed deer jawbones, we're looking at the lower jawbone, the ones down here at the bottom, and, um, and we're just looking at one side. So we're, it, it doesn't matter if it's right or left, but we're looking at one side and we're looking at what is known as the cheek teeth or these right here along the edge, not those out in front, those incisors, those ones that they take and, and cut grass into pieces. So you're going to be looking at the cheek teeth. The first thing you wanna do when you get a jawbone or you're looking at a picture, you want to be able to count the number of teeth, cheek teeth that they have on one side. So if they have less than six cheek teeth, or that sixth tooth isn't fully erupted or up in the jawbone, that's a deer that's six months old or less. So that is what we would place in the category of fawns. By 17 months, the deer are going to have all six cheek teeth, okay? So they're gonna have all six cheek teeth. So then you wanna count from front to back, one, two, three, and you're gonna look at this third tooth in, this tooth right here, this third premolar, and you wanna see if the third premolar is tricuspid where it has three main ridges, one, two, three, or if it is bicuspid where it has two main ridges, one, two, okay? If it, they have six cheek teeth, 
and a tricuspid third premolar, that is going to be a 17 month old deer. And this is a baby tooth essentially. So between 17 and 18 months, that deer is going to lose that baby tooth and it's going to get replaced by its adult tooth. And that adult tooth is going to come in as a bicuspid. It's where it's going to have two main ridges. So in the 18 month old deer, um, that uh, third tooth is going to be a bicuspid and typically it has little to no wear. And when we're talking about wear on these teeth, we're not talking about all this brown right here along the sides of the teeth. That is plaque. And that's because be, um, deer can't actually um, brush their teeth like we do. Our teeth would look like that if we weren't brushing them all the time. When I'm talking about wear, however, it's on the top or the grinding surface of the teeth. And essentially that grinding surface is going to wear down the enamel and expose dentin, so underneath the enamel. On an 18-month-old deer, their bicuspid is going to be brand new. Sometimes that bicuspid isn't even fully emerged in the, um, in the jawbone, so it might like be really, really tiny compared to the other teeth because it's still kind of coming up. Think about when you lose teeth and, and you've got those teeth that are coming back up and growing in, in the jawbone there. So by two and a half years and older, that bicuspid is going to really start to wear down. And if you look at the top, you'll see this kind of brownish line. And that is, um, that is the dentin that is, is wearing through um, after the enamel has worn away. So um, on these younger deer, you're going to see that dentin on um, those 17 month or, or baby teeth, essentially. And that's just because they have less enamel as babies than they do as adults. A lot of younger kids get cavities a lot um, on their baby teeth, a lot more than adults. And it's just because they have that very thin enamel. So if you see a tricuspid and you have all six cheek teeth, it's a 17 month. If it is a bicuspid third premolar, okay, and um, it has no wear, almost no wear, and you can also look at the sixth tooth as well, but really that that tricuspid or that bicuspid third premolar, no wear, going to give you a clue that it's an 18 month old deer. By two and a half and older, we're going to start seeing that bicuspid be worn down, and sometimes these deer can really wear down their teeth. It's really difficult to reliably age deer after two and a half years. So we only look at these four age classifications during um, our data seasons when we're collecting data on white-tailed deer harvest here in Maryland. So this is something that we do at the state level every hunting season. And it's a, something that we want you to learn how to do as well. Okay. And I see a question. Um, from Angela, is the spur different in farm-raised turkeys? And that's a, a really good question. I would imagine that farm-raised turkeys are still going to have those spurs, but I'm not sure. So um, I imagine it, it's still a trait they would have. Now I know farm-raised turkeys will have much different colors than our wild turkeys just because they're bred and selectively bred, so. All right. So the last category that we're going to be doing is wildlife and society. And um, in the wildlife and society, some of the things that I want you to know are the differences between native species or how to define native species, invasive species, and um, what's considered to be rare here in Maryland. So um, how would you define an invasive species? What is the definition of an invasive species? While you're typing that in, I'm gonna answer some of these questions. Orion, deer only have two sets of teeth. So they have the baby teeth, AKA the milk teeth, the ones that they're going to lose. And then they have their adult set of teeth. But I'm sure there's probably some oddballs out there, just like we in the human population, some of us grow extra teeth. So, um, so there's probably a possibility that some of our white-tailed deer might grow a third set. And um, that would be really beneficial for them because tooth wear over time can be, um, can be problematic for those species. So when we look at those um, teeth on the deer, we're usually looking at hunter harvested deer. So, um, so we're looking at deer that are already dead and we're looking at um, the teeth in their jawbones on the lower jawbone. 
sometimes when we're doing research, we will tranquilize the deer and also be able to look at their, their teeth. But usually most of that data is collected during hunting season from, um, from those deer at butcher shops and places like that. Okay. So I see some answers to my question about invasive species and the definition there. Yeah. So invasive species are non-native species that cause problems. And those problems include ecological problems like outcompeting our native species or causing disease. They can cause human health problems and or they can cause economic problems. And so I've got a picture of an invasive species here in Maryland. Do you all know what uh, invasive this is right here? This invasive rodent from South America. Yeah, it's the nutria, AKA the koipu, um, which is another name for it. And if you were using the field guides we normally use, it's known as the koipu. So this animal looks a lot like our local beaver, which is native, but it has a more squared off face and it has white whiskers. Um, those white whiskers and the, uh, are one of the identification characters. If you're trying to distinguish the invasive nutria from a local species like our beaver. So um, we have those native species, we have non-native species, which are from other areas or other regions. And then we have those invasive species that are the non-native species that are problematic. So not all non-native species are invasive, but all invasive species are non-native, just something important to know. We also have over 1,250 rare threatened endangered species in Maryland. And there's many different reasons for rarity of species here in the state. And so we go through some of those reasons for rarity in the study guide. So check that out and check out some of our pages on rare threatened and endangered species. Some of the other things that we want you to know are some of the wildlife diseases that affect our different species. Does anybody know what disease typically affects our um, amphibians and reptiles, excuse me, here in Maryland? And type that in the chat. What's an amphibian and reptile disease that we have? Ronavirus, yeah. So ronavirus is, um, is an actu actually an invasive disease that we have that's affecting cold-blooded vertebrates, like mostly our reptiles and amphibians and certain species are getting hit harder than others. So we've documented it in multiple counties here in Maryland. And one of the biggest things, um, if you're going out and herping right now, is making sure that you properly disinfect the soles of your shoes and any equipment before and after you go out to these different vernal pools or temporary wetlands. If you're going out to watch the frogs singing and the salamanders migrating and all the wonderful things that are happening this time of year as, as spring and, and our wildlife start to emerge. So keep that in mind um, that ronavirus is a con in consideration and disinfection of your equipment and, and boots and all of that is very important to helping to protect our local wildlife species. So understanding some of that basic information about some of those major diseases that affect our wildlife, as well as major pieces of legislation that protect our wildlife species, both at the national and at the state level. So um, some of that legislation includes the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which um, essentially protects all marine mammals, our seals and our whales and our dolphins, and makes sure that people don't harass them, capture them and or kill them. So, um, so that's a really important piece of legislation that protects them. So let's practice. Um, let's, uh, let's try out a few questions that are similar to what you might see. So you can just kind of get a feel for some of the things that I want you to know. So I have a turtle here on the screen. And the first question is a vocabulary term. What is the name for the top part of the turtle shell? So if you can type that in the chat. And then also, what order is this reptile in? And what is its common name? So see if you can figure this out and you can use that PDF from, the, um, from our wildlife page on reptiles and amphibians, so you can consult that. See if you can answer those questions. What's the name for the top part of the turtle shell? What order is this reptile in? 
and what is its common name? So as you look at this turtle, look at some characters. Um, for turtles, I usually look at the shell. So looking at color patterns on the shell, looking at some of the facial characteristics too can also be helpful. And then um, looking at the scales on the shell, AKA the scoops. So for some species like diamondback terrapins, they've got those big concentric rings. And, um, and then uh, things like the wood turtle have like, you know, big bumps and all of that, so. So um, I see some votes for carapace. So yes, the top part of the turtle shell, oops. <laughs> I put plus run. I'm wrong. It's the carapace. So, um, so it is the carapace, but I'm not seeing the order. What is the scientific order for this reptile? So the order. Remember the taxonomy? We go kingdom, phylum, class. So this is in um, the class reptilia. So, um, and then we go to order, family, genus, species. So I see some correct um, answers for the common name. They're actually in testudines. Um, I always say this wrong. So that is the order for reptiles, I'm um, sorry, for turtles. So we also have the order Anura, which is what our frogs and our toads are in. Um, and we have Caudata for our salamanders and newts. So that's all contained in that document. So understanding where you're going to find that information and that taxonomy is going to be helpful. And this is our bog turtle. This is a federally listed species. Its carapace only gets a couple inches in length as an adult. And it is really um, threatened by habitat loss. And then also predators. Um, predation is driving some of the, its loss in some of these different wetlands. So it needs these really open wetlands with lots of grasses in it. We call them fens, really important for this species. And then unfortunately, this species is also threatened by a legal trade um, of, of wildlife. So that's another concern for this species. All right, let's look at this turkey here. We've got a turkey on the screen. What sex is this turkey and why? So explain your reasoning for why you are calling it that. What sex is this turkey and why? So remember, um, look at things like the coloration of the head. Look at um, the coloration of the breast feathers. Look at those legs. Good, good. Yeah, so if you look closely, you'll see those brown tips on those breast feathers, so those buffy tips. So, and overall, the, um, the appearance is quite, um, quite dull, even though she does have a, a pretty nice, nicely colored head. So, um, and then if you look at her legs, she doesn't have those spurs. So this is a female. So being able to explain um, that information is also something I want you to do, not just guess male or female, but say why. So those are also things to know. All right, let's age this deer. How old do you think it is? Good information, Anya. Any guesses on the age of this deer? He's got some big antlers. <laughs> Five or six. All right. Well, this is a trick question because you can't reliably age white-tailed deer with their antlers. And that's one of the reasons why we, um, we teach you how to, uh, to age them via their jawbone. So I've got a deer jawbone here and hopefully you can see my, my big screen. So um, let's 
see. That didn't help. I guess it's just going to be backwards. So um, try this way. All right. So first step, aging a deer jawbone. What do you want to look at? What's the first step? What's the first thing you should do to age a deer jawbone? Count the teeth. Yeah. So we've got one tooth here. We've got the second tooth here. We've got the third tooth here, fourth tooth, fifth tooth, and we've got six teeth. So six teeth. So what's the next one, next step to do if we have six teeth? Look at the third tooth and look at those cusps, right? So this has six teeth. So that means it's not a fawn or a six month old deer. So we're gonna look at the third tooth. So one, two, three. And uh, looking at this, how many ridges do you see? How many main ridges do you see? Main ridges. Yeah, it looks, it's a little harder um, I'm noticing on, uh, on this. This is actually a, um, a bicuspid tooth. It works, looks a little easier. Ah, this is easier this way. So shifting it around sometimes can help you out too. So you see this, this is one and that's two. So this is a bicuspid. Sorry, it looked a little, uh, little different on the other, other side there. So we got a bicuspid tooth. So that means that it is at least 18 months, but it could also be two and a half plus. So what's the next thing we want to look for? We want to look for where, yeah. And so remember, we're not looking at, at right here, this plaque, that's not what we're looking for. We are looking at the top of this tooth, okay? And you see right, right here, that little brown stripe, that brown stripe right there? That is that dentine that we're looking for. We're not looking at this crud right here in the middle of the tooth. Ooh. See, that was like corn or something like that that the deer had. But um, that little brown stripe is going to tell you that that's some dentine that's showing through on that tooth. And if we look at the sixth tooth, we will see even more evidence of that dentine as well. So, um, so you see those, those right here, especially, you see that dentine stripe. So this is at least two and a half years. So we would call it two and a half plus for, um, for this individual here. So again, um, you can look at the, um, the video that we have posted on the website, and that's going to tell you a little bit more of how to identify or age deer based on their jaw bones. So, okay. All right, next practice question. What family is this bird in? So we've got, we've got a bird. We've got a family. So look at, look at its characteristics. So this is where it's really helpful to look at characters of different animals and understand species groupings. So even if you don't know what this bird is, what kind of bird does it look like? What are you noticing? What kind of bird does it look like? A woodpecker, right? So knowing it's got that nice chisel-like bill, right? And that that um, that head and, and just these special feet. These are called zygodactyl feet because there's two up front and two in the back. And that's good for helping them climb up and down those trees. So it's in the woodpecker family. So um, when I ask for things like family and order and all of that, I want the scientific names. So, so I want you to look up that document and see if you can find out the scientific name for the, the woodpecker family. And then see if you can figure out the common name for this woodpecker and um, what piece of legislation protects birds like this one, okay? So I'm seeing in the chat, I see some pickaday. Yeah, so pickaday. It's nice, that's, that's easy for me to remember, even if you don't have the document, because they've got those big chisel-like bills and they're always picking at things like trees and stuff like that to get the insects out. So pick a day. And spelling is important when you're entering in these names, especially since I'm giving you the document with the, the names in it. 
So make sure you're, you're spelling correctly. And again, I'm gonna be asking for those scientific families and orders and all of that. So, um, so I want you to write things like pick a day. Um, but I did ask for the common name and I see several people have identified it as the hairy woodpecker. Yes, so there's another species of woodpecker that looks very similar. It's called the downy woodpecker. So how do you know this is different from the downy woodpecker? What told you it was a hairy woodpecker and not a downy woodpecker? Yeah, that really long beak length, right? Because I want you to be able to explain why you're making these decisions. So hairy woodpeckers have much longer bills or beaks than the downy woodpeckers. If you were able to see it, it's, it's a bigger woodpecker too. And there's one other character as well, but looking at these outer tail feathers on the downy woodpecker, it's going to be spotted, but it's white on the hairy woodpecker. So that's another um, identification character to look for. Now let's talk about what piece of wildlife legislation protects birds like this hairy woodpecker. So this is one of those wildlife and society type questions that we want you to know. What piece of wildlife le legislation is going to protect the species like this? Excuse me. This is a hairy woodpecker. It is a native bird species here in Maryland. So what piece of wildlife legislation is going to protect them? Yeah, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is an international treaty between the United States and Canada and I think Mexico and Russia maybe. Um, so, uh, so yes, it is an international migratory treaty that protects our, um, our native bird species. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And that's one of those major pieces of wildlife legislation that we want you to know. All right, um, really quick, some true or false. So we're gonna bang these out. True or false, two species in the cervidae, AKA deer family can be found in Maryland. Two cervid species, true or false. Cervidae. true. Yeah, we've got the Sika deer and the white-tailed deer. And the Sika is actually a type of, of elk. All right. What about true or false? The cottonmouth is a venomous snake found in Maryland. And there's a picture of the cottonmouth right there. False. Yeah, so we only have the copperhead and the timber rattlesnake as our venomous species here in Maryland. What about the Atlantic Flyway is a major migration route for Canada geese? True. Yeah, there are multiple different flyways. So we are located along the Atlantic Flyway. There's also the Central Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway. But we are along the Atlantic coast, so that's a major spot for a lot of our, de our, our Canada geese. And finally, trapping is an important wildlife management tool. True or false? Trapping is an important wildlife management tool. It's true. Hunting and trapping are very important types of wildlife management tools that we use because you can live trap animal species and we do that for research. Some species have to be trapped um, with foot leg holds and things like that or with different types of box traps. Those can be really important to be able to capture those species to, to research them. So uh, hunting and trapping, important wildlife management tools. All right, last question, and then well, I'll take some questions So from you. So during the last century, human impacts on our planet have led to an increase in an alarming loss of biodiversity. Scientists estimate that the current extinction rates exceed those of prehistoric mass extinctions. Loss of biodiversity also means loss of genetic diversity and loss of ecosystems. In Maryland, what is the major cause for biodiversity loss? Major cause. 
habitat destruction loss and um, alteration and fragmentation, spread of invasive species, pollution, illegal collection, or climate change, which is the major reason for biodiversity loss here in Maryland. Good. It is A, habitat loss and, um, and destruction, alteration, all of that. That is the major region for biodiversity loss across much of the United States too. So it's not just specific to Maryland. All right, so we've got a couple minutes left um, and, uh, and we are, I'm gonna open it up to more questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and whatever questions you have. So I see a question already from Violet. And in terms of using other field guides during the test, I'm just going to ask that you use those PDFs that are going to be provided during the test. So I don't want you to access other field guides because not everybody's going to have the same resources. So, so you will be limited to those PDFs. Any other questions? Thank you, April. Any other questions about wildlife? And it doesn't have to be specific to Envirothon. So if you've got general questions about wildlife careers and things like that, can also help you with that. And no, Sasha, you will not have to know bird calls for the Maryland State Envirothon, but if you make it to the North American level, then you will be required to, uh, to know bird calls. So that's usually part of a test at the North American level. And um, the PDFs, printing them out, I prefer that you, um, you use them in the testing platform. So the next wildlife training is going to cover the same material. So we just offered it twice. And I don't know how many questions there are, Shelby, but, um, but it will be worth about, I think, 65 points. And only one team goes from the state to the North American level. So I think we have like 40 teams that are participating. So uh, whoever gets the high score in, in all the categories or overall, the highest score overall, you will move on to the North American level. It's actually North American, so um, so we're competing against Canada. So it's different uh, different United States, uh, different states in Canada, and um, and Kylie, I see there's a question about life cycle habitat. So it's more that um, habitat can change for the life cycle of different animals. If you think about our amphibians right now, um, a lot of them are traveling to those vernal pools. They're migrating to those vernal pools, AKA temporary wetlands, and they're breeding in them. So, um, so during breeding time and, and those aquatic state or the larval stages, um, the juvenile stages, they're going to be aquatic and they're going to use that aquatic habitat. Whereas um, some of them are going to go through metamorphosis and then go return to terrestrial habitats to live out their adult lives. So, um, so some species are going to use those different habitats and then some are just going to stay in the same old habitat throughout their life. So it really depends on the species. Good question. And April offered to give a um, quick rundown of the, uh, the test platform because it's something new for all of us this year. So April. Absolutely. So the test platform will be using the University of Maryland's uh, Canvas system called ELMS. Um, it will be a um, course delivery program, so to speak. It's going to be very similar to um, 
things that you've seen before. I don't know all the systems you're using in your schools right now, but everyone I've shown it to um, from the school district has said, oh, that looks like so-and-so or so-and-so. Um, essentially, you'll go into, and we'll provide some screenshots and some um, overview prior to the test. We're still working on getting the material into the platform. So we'll be able to provide some type of tutorial that you can see. Um, it won't be Google Forms, but um, everyone will have access um, from your team to the testing platform and you will meet together whether it's in person or virtually and one person will submit the test on your behalf. Um, within the platform you'll have the ability to click on links that will open in background tabs or new windows. Um, that is where you will have access to the PDFs for field guides and any other resources you'll need for any part of the exams um, or the competition, not just wildlife. So we'll be providing some more information about that as we get closer. I did send out an email today that most of you should have received. If you didn't, it's probably because we didn't have an email address for you, but I'm gonna put a link to that email in the chat, um, which talks a little bit about setting up that Elms account, um, as well as um, more trainings that are coming up. And then a link to our frequently asked question page, which we are updating daily. So if you have a question, you can shoot it to me. Um, my email is going to be in the email, um, and you can um, ask me, and I will happily uh, provide an answer to you and add it to the FAQ. Um, but we're learning as you're learning, and we're still setting things up, but we'll provide some sort of tutorial and some screenshots so that you can see what the test platform will look like, and you'll have the ability to log in about a week before. You won't see the exams. Um, but you'll be able to play with the platform a little bit so you get comfortable with it. And then during the day, you ha you'll have two hours to complete each, each subject area. So you have two hours to do all of wildlife, two hours to do all of aquatics, et cetera. Um, tests aren't required to have a proctor, um, but uh, we are going on the honor system here. Um, and yes. Carrie, I see we've got a couple more questions. I know we are getting close to the end of the, oh, we're all at 7.01. <laughs> yeah, um, and I saw a question about uh, how do you recommend you study for the test? So, you know, generally in Envirothon, you're working on a team. And I always suggest to play to your team's strengths. So somebody might be more into wildlife than others. Um, I'm that wildlife person. I am not your soils person, right? <laughs> so rely on the strength of your teammates and work together. Um, that's what I really, really suggest. Break stuff up and, and try to have folks work on things and, um, and consult one another and make sure you have those good team dynamics. That's going to be really, really important. So in terms of the wildlife test, um, being familiar with the, the study guide, so those concepts that are in that study guide, how to age and sex white-tailed deer and wild turkey, just those being able to use those PDFs and identify wildlife. So looking at pictures and understanding maybe some of those species groups and that taxonomy, just going through it and being familiar with that, that's going to help you. And um, those are mainly the big things. So we have it on our page, um, the kind of material that we're focusing on for the 2021, just because um, we're not going over all the stuff but like we would normally do in a live, uh, live competition. Each test section, I, I see there's a question about how many questions are in each section. Um, there are going to be, each, each test area is going to be broken up into smaller parts. So wildlife is going to have five sections. Mm -hmm. um, so that two hours will be divided over those five sections and there'll be smaller chunks of questions. Um, Carrie, I'm not sure if you know exactly how many questions yet, but yeah, I know aquatics is about 15 questions and four sections. Mm -hmm. um, some have a couple extra, some don't, but it's about an average of um, that and we are giving you between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on how much you have to look at resources or how much is more just a knowledge based and things that you would have studied. You are not allowed to use external sources. We are no Googling, none of that. Um, but we will provide you the field guide, uh, PDFs, the dichotomous keys, the resources that you need for all the areas um, within the test platform itself. So everything should be self-contained. <laughs> 
Um, as we're close to the end, any final words before I stop the recording? And then if you want to stay and answer questions, I will leave that up to you. But I'll let you um, wrap up for the recording. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm really happy to see your interest in Envirothon. And it's a really important event. I will say a lot of people that I know who I work with in the natural resources field have gone through Envirothon. And I'm kind of jealous that I didn't have that opportunity as a high school student. So I'm really proud that you're taking that step and working on this. So thank you for that. Please feel free to reach out with any questions that you might have and um, have fun. So this is all about enjoying and learning about this information. And I know it's a little stressful with it being a competition, but we also want you to take, you know, joy in, in learning all this stuff. So hope you enjoy learning all of it and have a great weekend and go out and go look at wildlife because there's a lot of stuff going on right now. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to start recording now, um, but we appreciate you being here and giving your time this evening. And we're very excited to have you compete this year. So thank you. <laughs>